Ko Marie Kaito, I hope I'm unmuted. E kara kia timata tenei, kia uru uru mai. A hau ora, a hau kaha, a hau maia, ki ronga, ki raro, ki roto, ki wao, ki re, ki re au, kai marire. Kai marire. Ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi oki a au ti e mauri ora. Te wari e tū nei, e ngā whare. Uh, tēnā koe, tēnā koutou. Te papa e tā koto aki nei, tēnā koe, tēnā kōrua. Ngā mate, aire, aire, are atu rā, rātou ia rātou, tātou ia tātou. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kā koe. Uh, ko tarana ki te maunga, ko au te te waka, ko waingo ngoro te awa, ko Nikola Tāwana tōke wenga wa no ngārua ine a au kei te noo au ki tāmaki makaurau. So on behalf of Te Wai Wai, the Auckland Women's Centre, there's an absolute pleasure to welcome you all to the space for our first forum in this series, which is Wainge Toa Kōrero, which is incredibly apt on this day, which is International Women's Day. Um, those of you who are familiar with our forums will know how lucky we are to have the Super Flash, Stacey Morrison, the real advocate, radio host, mama, and tele presenter. And she will be interviewing another Wa'ime of Mana, writer, mama, and Dr. Emma Espina, no mai and Nama i Emma and Stacey. I'll hand it over to you. Tēnā koe te tuakana nakala tēne kamahiki a koe i roto i tō a hurumouai o tō kainga. Aha koe e pāngi ana koe ki te māwiwi kino o te wā e rongo tonu nei au i te ngākau māhaki, i te arohanui e rere mai ana ki au. Nō reira tēne kamahiki a koe e te heamana i te kai arahi o tātou i tēnei rā me te pāwhaka wairua i a tātou i tēnei rā. Nakala tēnā koe o te rā, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora koutou. Thank you so much for making time in your day. International Women's Day, congratulations. You get to do everything <laughs> and it's a treat to be able to do something for yourself. That's what you have chosen to be with us tonight. So thank you for bringing your energy. Ko Stacey Morrison, tōku I am very fortunate to be with you tonight and a woman that you all admire because you've taken the time to jump on board. He uri a hau, no ngai tahu, no te tahu tōku kuia, no te arua tū haurangi tai atu rā ki tū whare toa. But it's not about me tonight. It's actually about this amazing woman who's about to go on the night shift. Oh my goodness. She is incredible and that's why you're all here. Uh, I would like to say, no mai ki tēnei whare, welcome to this whare kōrero that we have created. I'm going to do some housekeeping now. Um, with regards to housekeeping, don't do it. It's a pandemic for goodness sake. <laughs> Do as little as possible, as much as you can manage, if you feel like it. But apart from that, the virtual housekeeping I would like to point out is that sometimes it's a little hard to navigate these Zoom systems. So I will give you a couple of pointers. First of all, you do have a few options on how you view this virtual room. You can use the gallery view and see multiple people. Or you can set it to speaker view. So you can pin a particular person. Now that's the option if you just want to watch our wonderful sign language interpreters, Tēnā Kōrua, Donna and Bridie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your mahi tonight. Otherwise, if you do nothing, um, it's just like housework. If you do nothing, no one's going to die. It's going to be fine. <laughs> and you'll just see me, Emma and our interpreters as well. Nō re rea hoa mā, me aro tātou ki te tino wahine o te rā. So if we talk about this woman who has gathered us here today. She's probably cringing a lot and I don't mind because we do need to celebrate the women who actually give us hope, give us inspiration and help us get better in so many different ways. Ko Emma Espina tōne ngoa nō te whānau wehe paihana, nō Ngāti Tukorehe, nō Ngāti Porau Hoki. Uh, Emma is a doctor. As a, shall I say one more time? She's going on the night shift tonight. Um, just, I just one more time. Need to point that out. She's a political commentator, 
Um, I know that her husband does okay in that area too, uh, but she's an award-winning writer, opinion writer of the year. She also speaks fluent meme, which I think is not recognised enough. Uh, also, she wants, she does say on Twitter, she wants to have a practical skill for when the zombie apocalypse um, happens. Pretty sure it's here, so mm -hmm. let's go live to the whare of Emma Espina. Tēnē ka mahi kia koe e te hoa, e mahi matihere atu nei kia koe, ko te tūmana koia e rongo ana koe te aroha noi o ngā wāhine e hui mai nei, e, e mahi ana kia koe, tuki te kauanu anu kia koe e tēnei wā, e te tākuta, tēnā koe. Would you like to? Tēnā koe e hoa, uh, e te kai karakia, um, tēnā koe e nakila, um, ngā wāhine e o, o te rōpū tēnei, te rōpū whakahirahira, uh, me koutou katoa, uh, ngā wāhine, <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I absolutely hated that. Um, Stacey, thanks. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I had planned to sort of flip it around and try and make this about Stacey. So, you know, watch out for that during the call. Uh, that's not going to happen. So, for this apocalypse, um, have, have you found your super skill when it comes to it? It's probably Twitter, isn't it? Maybe, yeah. I mean, Twitter's a funny thing. Like, it's um, especially, you know, in the context of, you know, the protests that have been happening um, over the last couple of weeks um, and, you know, um, an era of Trump. Um, there's a lot of criticism of social media. Um, and I understand that. And it's not always a safe place, especially for Wahine. But um, for me, Twitter's been a great community. Um, I, I mute everyone that I don't follow. So, like, I don't get responses from reply guys and bots and things like that but um, I just wanted to show you all actually because I've got um, I didn't want to flex and wear my death and my you know hospital lanyard <laughs> to this for weeks so I thought it would be weird but um, I've got three pins um, on my lanyard and the first is from uh, Twitter wahine uh, Peppa Raccoon who um, made this beautiful commemorative pin for uh, the New Zealand Women in Medicine um, there's an unvaccinated um, pin from one of the anaesthetists on Twitter who dropped it into my letterbox one day and then this here just arrived from Karen Wilton who um, sent it after I said longingly that I would quite like this beautiful uterus pin that um, she got when she joined family planning so you know that's kind of I guess that just really reflects what, what Twitter has been for me in terms of the community so yeah I'm actually quite grateful and I find it a really nice place most of the time. Yeah I think that's where I first stalked you and decided I need to be friends with you so right. Yeah, a, a uterus pin, what more could any of us ask for? Just quickly, um, if you do have questions, we do have some that are being pre-sent, so we're going to prioritise those. But um, the tikanga is, if you do want to put questions in the chat, then we will be able to answer a few around 8 o'clock. Now, when we talk about Women's Centre, Emma, that probably brings up images of Lower Hutt and your mum, Cole, because um, some people here will know your mum and the fact that you're no stranger to the Lower Hutt Women's Centre. What are some of the positive legacies of your time uh, there and that sort of upbringing that you've had? Interesting that you should mention Cole because I texted her before and I was like, are you coming? <laughs> she's like, I can't find the link. So I just quickly <laughs> sent her the link. So I'm pretty sure she's there. Hi, mum. Um, yeah, so so I, we grew up, I grew up in the hut um, and mum was um, part of the Lower Hut Women's Centre. And, you know, our family has always been pretty um, um, incautious about how much we tell the children. So um, we were exposed to a lot of life's realities early on. Um, a, a lot because, you know, that was our family's reality so you know we um, don't come from money and there were some really hard times so um you know there yeah we weren't kind of sheltered um i don't think and then as an extension of that you know to be involved in something like the lower hut women's center was um i mean i complained about it all the time you know as a kid i, was like, I hate going there i don't want to hang out with your friends i don't want to see these people but um as a young woman to be exposed to um a woman only space um to feel at home and safe and protected um, and it's kind of like that, you know, that concept of a third place, you know, um, in community building where there's, you know, somewhere separate from your work and home. Um, and that's critical to a functioning society. So also like libraries were really important to me growing up. Um, so that was, yeah, foundational. Um, and so it was women running things for the benefit of other women. Um, but it was also lessons in um, how difficult life is for a lot of women. Um, and so for a long time, the Women's Refuge was co-located on the same site. Um, and so, you know, it was a pretty real um, insight into the pointy end of abuse and, and things like that. But it was also really um, 
you know, cool to see the kind of transformative things that women can do to help each other. So, um, you know, running courses, financial literacy, or, you know, um, that weird, you know, those um, recycled books that we used to make, you know, like you make the pulp up yourself and then make them into a weird kind of oh, yeah. lobby book, you know, that kind of, you know, and so there were like workshops for kind of everything that you could imagine. Um, and then the, the main thing that I remember about um, kind of growing up at the Lower Hutt Women's Centre is the quote on the wall, which was um, from an, an Aboriginal elder, which said, if you've come to help me, you're wasting your time. Um, but if you've come because your liberation is bound up um, in mine, then let us work together. And so that's, yeah, I think as a driving value uh, or kaupapa for my life, um, that, that would be it. Kilda, so you remember looking at that quote and it, what did it say to you? And if you want to repeat one more time, I'm just noticing how well Donna's doing, but could you repeat? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, so the quote is, um, and I think, I think it was an Aboriginal elder's response to a social worker. Um, and she said, if you've come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up in mine, then let us work together. Um, Mum's just texting me to say, yes, that's right. You know, you've got it right. <laughs> um, but, you know, and so, so it was huge and it was, you know, of course, in a purple, um, you know, piece of paper, of one of those blobby recycled papers. Um, and Mum's partner at the time, Mandy, had, um, had, had written it out. She was a teacher and she'd written it out in that, you know, painfully correct teacher's handwriting. Um, so, so, yeah, so huge impact. And that's, you know, the beauty of writing and communication is that you can um, put those things around and then your children um, will take them on board. In terms of being bound in liberation, does that have relevance to how you view health equity? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> there's so much, as we know, about Māori women's health in particular that comes from that loss of liberation through colonisation, but also um, the, um, the consequences of the colonising force being a patriarchal society. You know, like we know from our um, our elders and, um, you know, what, what's been passed down that our culture of pre-colonisation was not what it is now. And that, um, oh, thanks, Catherine, yeah. Um, and so that, so colonisation happened to women and to Māori women in two different ways. So it was that, that loss of home and family and everything, but then it was also loss of that balance between men and women and, um, and our roles in society. And, and so that all of the health consequences for Māori women, because we feel worse than, you know, we're right at the bottom for everything, um, stems from that. One of the questions that came in is, what does mana wahine mean to you? Well, I think to a storyteller, mana wahine is, um, you know, about having, reclaiming your story. And so, um, so when I think about it, I think about our rights as Indigenous women to our own stories. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm so grateful as well for being, having been born when I was, you know, um, I think it's incumbent on all of us doing this work in this time to um, look at the whakapapa of, of what's gone before and why we are able to do what we're able to do. Um, and so, you know, there's an enormous body of research uh, and knowledge that's readily available to me, to my daughter now, that wouldn't have been, you know, even, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, because of the incredible women that have done this work of reclamation before. So, um, yeah, kind of slipping into the, into that legacy is, is an incredible privilege, um, and, I, and I don't take it lightly. And I think, you know, anything that sort of seems easy for me, you think, oh, well, it must have been really fucking hard <laughs> for the ones that went before. Oh, yeah, did I mention she's a bit sweary too? Yeah. Um, I got to 18 minutes in. <laughs> That's a very good effort. And what you just described then is what someone once said about you, that your superpower is translating Māori stuff for Pākehā. So what is just one thing or a couple of things that you wish particularly that non-Māori would know without needing explaining? And this is a question that has come in on the... Uh, that has been registered. So what do you wish particularly that non-Māori would know without explaining? Or do you feel happy to explain it all? No. Um, so I, I need to elaborate on that though. So I was working in a predominantly Māori organisation, so Hapati Haura, which is a Māori public health, uh, the biggest Māori public health um, non-governmental organisation. And so that my colleagues would just crack up 
at these profound revelations that people would have over some of the columns that I was writing. Um, and I'd just be like, Emma, you're stating the obvious. I don't know why people are losing their minds over what you've written. And I was like, okay, <laughs> because it was, you know, obvious to us. Um, but it's not obvious to everyone. And I think as, you know, when you have a bicultural foundation yourself, you know, um, that's of interest, you know, like, so your Pākehā side's always explaining to your Māori side and vice versa and kind of trying to figure that out. And so it's actually one of my favourite things to do um, as a mental exercise. Um, the actual practice of it in person is, is can be really hōhā, right? Because um, I think, you know, for us, relationships are everything. And so if you have a really solid relationship with someone and they're saying to you, I really want to understand how, you know, to design this project so that it doesn't, you know, negatively affect Māori or that we get good results or whatever, then that's great because you have that relationship. But um, so the last, in the last year or so, I've had a couple of requests from colleagues at work who have said, oh, I've got this project that needs um, a Māori sign off. Um, can you can you write a letter in support? Um, and from people that I don't know, um, and I've had no involvement in their research and don't know anything about them and it's kind of due next week sort of thing and you see that a lot you know we've been asked to provide the brown tick for stuff and so that's where sometimes your um you know interventions to try and make things more equitable so the dhb has asked people to um you know get maori sign off for things to try and make projects research projects safer um can actually fall down and provide you know more work for already overworked Māori in your organisation. Is Stacey frozen for other people? Yes. Hmm. I'll just elaborate while you sort that out because there's just a little bit more to say on that. Um, and I think, um, actually, I'll talk about Stacey while she's not here so I can get away with it. Um, so people like Stacey actually incredible inspiration because they're the perfect combination of that um, sense of responsibility and um, and um, very staunch when it comes to it, but also incredibly inclusive. Um, and, you know, that that kind of, um, I guess, roadmap for how to bring people with you is something that's really inspired me. I took the opportunity, Stace, to talk about you while you were... <laughs> um, well, that is... The kids took the opportunity to use the Wi-Fi, so sorry about that. But yeah, and I think, um, so, so, so yeah, it's a tricky thing. I do, I, I love doing that work. And I think a lot of us do find, um, you know, real satisfaction in, in um, collaborating and working in partnership with others. Um, but I think there's also work that people can do themselves. And so, um, you know, I think about us as, as Māori women, you know, like we, we've had to take responsibility for our own learning to learn about ourselves. And I think the least that we can expect of others who are wanting to know more about, you know, tell Māori or, or what have you, that they can probably do a little bit of that as well before coming to you and expecting you to do it for them. So when you started talking about this translation bridging service and writing <laughs> your columns, who do you picture when you're writing those columns and did you actively um, pitch to the people who need to mm. understand and that at Hapai Te Hauora they were saying, well, that, that's obvious mm. because that's the everyday experience. How did you come up with your kaupapa or mm. what were you aiming to achieve? Actually, that's a really good question. It's something that, um, that so Rene, you know, our, our awesome um, Māori writer, activist, playwright, um, I did a writing course with her last year and um, one of the first questions she said was, who do you write for? And I said, well, me first. <laughs> um, and she was like, great, great answer. <laughs> um, because that, 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 that is it really. And that's kind of that bicultural um, identity thing is that you're explaining yourself to yourself. And so, um, and I think that's the connection part of it maybe. I don't know, maybe people feel connected to that um, as a, I, hate, I don't want to say journey, but as that journey, you know, um, because we're all trying to figure ourselves out now, you know, in the Aotearoa of 2022, you know, who are we as people and who are we as a nation? Who, who do we want to be? Um, particularly difficult at the moment. I don't know about everyone here, but I find it impossible to think about anything other than tomorrow right now. You know, like it's, I've got a couple of writing deadlines that are, you know, future focused and I just can't, I don't know, I, don't know, I need to lie down. <laughs> yeah. But are you finding, are people giving you good 
I guess they're giving you space, knowing that you work at Middlemore Hospital, a place that's under massive stress. Surely and hopefully, mm. are people giving that space, or have they just given up on that? Um, no, like I, I only really work with people that I like now. Um, that's the really nice thing about having been, you know, having doing been doing it for a while. Um, and yeah, I just don't reply to any of the others. <laughs> Life's too short. There's no time, you know. Um, yeah, and 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 it depends, you know, like well, we're we're the same in that respect, you know. What what's the cope upper? Who's behind it? Um, you know, is it going to make a meaningful difference? And can I do it? Um, yeah, and so so a lot of that stuff. You just have. But that's an important reality that at the moment it's one foot in front of the other, and surviving. Yeah, yeah, and I and that's I guess I, I miss doing more writing at this time because that is the connection you know and that and that's why it's so amazing to see so many people here with us tonight because the biggest um um casualty of, of covid and lockdowns has been our loss of connection with each other and it's um you know and and we'll be feeling that for a long time and it's it's that i guess kind of that apathy and hopelessness about what's next and should i care and does my work mean anything and you know that that is a really pervasive feeling i think for everyone at the moment so um yeah, I, I I would like to be doing more, but um, yeah. No, you can't do more. Zombie it's apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're doing quite enough. And and one of the questions that came through, obviously, that read one of your pieces and said, I know you've written about midwifery. Why do you think this is such an important area, but so neglected and low status? Is it mm. to do with the fact that women are, are generally midwives? Uh, and also, what can we do about that? Yeah, so that is, it's it's fascinating, and I'll just pivot briefly to the this situation with nurses at the moment in our hospitals. So, in our pre chat um, before we came on tonight, we were talking about how the um, the workforce problems and health at the moment, certainly at my hospital, are the um, the nursing shortages. Um, and so they had, they called in, they they put out a call for help last night, night, be night before last asking for junior doctors to volunteer to not to cover nursing shifts but just to come in and kind of help and it was pretty confronting for um for both my colleagues and the nurses because that you know we our jobs are so different and we couldn't even do i didn't go on because i'm on already but a couple of friends did uh, just couldn't even do basic things that nurses do you know and they're just the glue that holds our hospitals together and um you know and i was chatting to one of the nurses last night who said that you know, a lot of our um, our workforce is out with COVID, but also with caring responsibility um, with children, you know, tamariki at home who are sick. So um, it just, you know, this this pandemic has really exposed all the gaps um, in, our, in, our, in our health system, but also our society and what we value and what we don't, you know. Um, and I really felt for our allied, allied health workforce um, colleagues who had to call off the strike that they planned for last Friday um, and because, I don't know kind of what went on behind the scenes but basically it was a terrible time to be striking but it just felt you know they were saying that you know they're overworked they're understaffed they're underpaid um and it would have been really nice to support them in their strike action um because that they're, they're the first ones to support us you know every time doctors strike it's that you know you get all this media coverage and it's great and everyone's you know behind you but then when it comes time to support your colleagues it's like, oh, but actually we need to keep the hospital running and they need to just keep doing their jobs so um so that the segue into midwifery is that yes you do see elements of that but it has always been super political um and i think i think it's because the um midwifery has been the battleground on which women's rights to equity and health has been fought so it's kind of like a proxy war for all the terrible things that have been done to women so you know that we've been overlooked in the research and um you know the developing interventions and um all sorts of things you know there's there have been um some amazing books written about um how male dominated um scientific research and, and healthcare has been um and so because midwifery is so woman-centric um it kind of is the natural place for that to be contested um and then of course there was the you know the shift um well, in the 90s when you know move, moving towards having you know midwives as lead maternity carers and um gps no longer you know being the kind of um obstetrics and gynecology specialists for everyone like they used to be so yeah it, it has been a really interesting um one to look into i and i think you know more than probably you know there are there are like clinical nurse specialists and things like that in every discipline but 
but the um, the requirement to collaborate between doctors and, and non-doctors, <laughs> um, obstetrics and gynaecology is, you know, requires the most collaboration in that respect. Um, what can we do to support them? I mean, that, you know, we're losing them in droves. They, you know, they've been uh, raising this as an issue for years. It's even worse with COVID. Um, and, you know, they talk about, then they're not paid enough, they're not supported. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, that's the first thing, but then it's, it's recognizing um, the value of the, of the role. And that again, you know, flips back down into what we're seeing in health now is just not valuing um, our health workers enough. So the mana that's attached to certain mm. roles isn't equitable. Yeah. Tell me about the speciality. Or are you open about what you're going to do from here, your pathway forward? Mm. Well, I like surgery, but it's also like, you know, there's a, there's a whole, but there's a whole lot of hoops to jump through. So, I mean, I can't, yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? And it also, um, you know, it's very vulnerable to have a dream, you know, so it's quite nice to just kind of do things and do things well and it's that's fine. But when you really and it was a bit like medical school actually, I mean I had no um hadn't shown any skill for science or anything leading up to when I decided to, you know, retrain and become a doctor. Um and so suddenly I had this dream and then it was it was terrifying because it, you know, you might fail. Um and that's a bit like planning for the next steps for me because you're like, well, there's no guarantee, it's so competitive and um lots of people want to do it, lots of people don't get to. Um it's very vulnerable, you know. Oh yeah. Um, I don't love it. don't love that as a vibe. No, um, <laughs> and I'm sorry for hitting that spot, but you know, it could be presumed that you just went, right, I worked in politics and now I'm going to be a doctor. Yeah. No. But it's challenging. And, and so when you are hit with that potential to, because you push the boat out to, to fail, what is some of the self-talk that happens and why do you keep on going? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question <laughs> at this time because um, my daughter said to me the other day, she, she, up until this point, she's shown no interest in what either myself or my husband does. And we're like, that's very, very sensible right now, you know. Um, and then the other day she said, oh, mama, I want to be a doctor. And I was just like, Really? <laughs> um, I'm so doing hard. my best to put you off here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, previously she said that she just wants to do nothing. And I was like, oh, that sounds great. Um, yeah, so it is, I mean, I guess it's just the spice of life stuff, really. You know, if you've got the privilege to have a dream and go after it, then, um, you know, you get one life. And, um, and failure is not, I mean, failure is not something to be frightened of um, because, you know, I, I remember I, I, I nearly failed one exam at medical school and I talked to um, the registrar who I was working with at the time, this incredible endocrinologist, Kate Rassu, who's now in Melbourne, she's like a goddess. I thought briefly I wanted to be an endocrinologist because of her, but it was really just because of her, yeah. Um, and I was so worried about having, you know, borderline to this um, exam and, you know, she just said everyone fails something at some point and this is a gift to you because you've, you've failed at something early enough that you can learn that it doesn't define you and that you'll recover and you'll bounce back I was like, that's 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 really cool so you know i try, try to look upon that vulnerability as a gift yeah. um yeah but all of it feels um yeah it, it's pretty intense in the context of everything else that's happening you know to try and carry something optimistic and um and important to you while the world is burning yeah we well, are okay. But also, can we flip back to that privilege bit? Because I don't. I also. I also think, you know, you have to really balance saying to people, have dreams, do what you want, find people that will support you. Um, you know, live your best life, live, love, love, um, and recognizing the very specific privileges that I had that allowed me to pursue this. Um, so, you know, um, had a husband that was willing to support me through six years of medical school. We owned our own home in Auckland, which is like incredibly. You know, we know. Um, family that was able to support, you know, mum moved up from, from Tarkika to look after Nico, you know, we financially, um, you know, I worked through the whole of med school, but we were okay. And so any, any one of those things falling over would have made it not possible. So it just, it's, you know, it's just really important, I think, to acknowledge um, what you have and what's enabled you to do what you can do. 
um, because it's a good way to deflect from what you've actually achieved. Well done. Um, <laughs> Should have got someone of... that didn't know me to do this, actually. <laughs> I would have been able to form them off for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, actually, no, just recognition of that vulnerability, but also what it takes to be in the arena, to be in what we call te mura o te ahi, so right in the fire pit, but also uh, putting yourself out there. Because someone said in a question, you, you're described as once working in politics and what did that involve exactly? I love that someone picked up on that because um, this is a bit like, um, so like being award winning, you know, like you can win one award and then you would be award winning for the rest of your life. So I, I worked in politics for, well, so I worked in parliament for a year um, and then obviously the political commentary stuff, you could kind of broadly talk about that but but yeah it's um it's been one of those things that's been kind of used to describe me and define me and and look it was a pretty definitive year so um I worked for a Labour MP Darren Hughes um for back in 2009 um I was taking a break from my career in recruitment um because the company that I worked for um had been sold to an evil Aucklander um I was like I was too to you know Wellington back then and you know just just Auckland was like hell no um and there was this maternity leave contract going and um darren was the mp for uh Horofenua at the time and that's obviously where um our two quarter here whanau is from uh and i thought oh well we've got kind of this labor party activism background um from you know my mum's partner mandy um he might recognize the wehi paihana surname um and you know to just kind of give it a crack um very naive you know like i said to oh god i'm sorry about this. but um on one of the first days there, I said to the woman whose maternity leave contract that I was covering, because it was pretty grim in Labour back then, you know, like they were, like a lot of the ministers had hung around, but were kind of in the process of leaving and blah, blah. Um, and I said to this woman, oh, I miss Helen. And she was just like, just say that a little bit quiet. <laughs> <laughs> like no political now at all, like shame. Um, How old would you have been then? I was 25 yeah so I mean I you know like I kind of fallen into this business career and thought I was you know hot shit and had nice clothes and had made quite a bit of money and all of that and then um yeah I thought I could just kind of waltz into this environment and you know be the smartest woman in the room and I was like nah these guys are you know legit and I and I I loved it like it was pretty a pretty it's a pretty weird environment to work in for more than a year I think you know like I wasn't I didn't feel like I was going to be a lifer. Um, but, and I have written before about the similarities between hospitals and parliament. So, um, you know, the intrigue, um, you know, the competing agendas, the real clannish behaviour, um, and then that just high octane noise of like a lot of really smart people in one place constantly disagreeing with each other. So, yeah, it was a really cool, like I took a lot from it. I mean, a husband as well, um, <laughs> which was, you know, um, convenient, but yeah, it wasn't wasn't for me long term. I think actually one of the nicest um, nicest things that happened there. Well, one of those kind of weird crossroads in life um, things. Um, Parikura Kuromia was there at the time, and his executive assistant was leaving, and um, they asked if I wanted to, you know, have a go at that. And I really thought about it, but I'd just also been offered a chance to go and work for Linda Fraser, um, Brooke Fraser's mum, who was this incredible. Um, mentor to me she was my intermediate teacher and then had gone to work in recruitment and I was going to go and hang out with her um but that's a real one of those paths you know like I think if I'd worked for Parikura um because the job was basically just traveling around the country with him sorting him out um, no one traveled more than him either yeah yeah and that would have been an incredible um yeah insight into into those that that role and that might have ended up being something different that I did but yeah so then you turn your attention to medical school. A question here is, when you think back to that young woman who started medical school, what do you know now that she didn't? The hours are very bad. <laughs> I was so very, naive, very oh my God. Yeah, I mean, we don't have a medical family. Like my husband's father is a professor of endocrinology, but he, you know, he's quite old now and he trained under a completely different system. And so, um, you know, we didn't really talk about the actual realities of the job. Um, I just thought I would be a doctor. I would go to med school and then just be a doctor. Um, and yeah, it's really just the beginning graduating. So um, I probably wouldn't tell that girl, woman, 
much about what it's like because I don't know that she would then commit to the path because it's just incredibly hard work. Um, and the, the junior doctor job's pretty unrewarding. Um, but it's just one of these things, I think, that you put, like, again, one foot in front of the other and then before long you're too committed to do anything else and so you just have to make the best of it. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah I, 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 I guess um, I've had lots of little kind of pearls of wisdom from... from I mean, a mentor would be a stretch for some of these people, but senior doctors that I've worked with who, um, you know, in moments of crises and, you know, your first year just sucks. Um, or the, the first three to six months really sucks. Um, you don't know what you're doing. You're terrified. Um, at a hospital like ours, there's just no room for error. It's so busy. Um, and so you've just, like, this constant anxiety. And I had a really bad shift, um, and I came into work the next day looking terrible. And my boss at the time said... Um, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I was like, oh, it's just terrible. Um, and he said, right, on his, these, this was like after one of those long day shifts where you're on call for a whole bunch of wards and things come up all the time. It's really busy and you're scared because you don't know how to make decisions when you're that junior. Um, he said, well, whenever I had something like that happen, I would just go and pick the sickest patient or a patient that I liked and go and spend some time with them. And Because you can only do you can only deal with one thing at a time and you can only deal with what's in front of you. And, and I've done that a lot since. And weirdly, cause you do, I mean, you know, it would be impossible to say that you don't get frustrated with, with your colleagues, the people you look after, you know, because of the nature of the work. Um, but on the long days and at nights, it's quite nice to just go and see someone. Um, and, and you know, you're in this kind of weird vortex of time together. It's 3 a.m you're there at work, they're there not sleeping because it's a hospital and you just, yeah, you can have that human connection, um, which is really nice. And I think, you know, the, the worst thing that our overworked health system has done to us is to remove that opportunity for connection. You know, they have this idea of compassion fatigue and, you know, when you just have too much to do that you can't take the time for people because the, the pe well, not everyone likes dealing with people, even some of my colleagues, but you know, if, if that's something, those relationships, if that's important to you, then that's a really fulfilling part of your job. And if you have to put it aside because you're too busy, then, um, yeah, it really takes all the fun out of it. Well, as you said earlier, whanangatanga, relationships is central to yeah. Māori approach to, to health, to toy order, uh, to well-being, all of those mm. things. So if we look to this question about the Māori Health Authority, what needs to happen for it to have a true impact on health inequities. Yeah, so it needs to have hard conversations and make politically risky decisions. So um, we have described the problems from every imaginable angle, with every interpretation, every, nu every nuance. So there is no lack of research or, um, or moral justification for change, um, but we still have inaction in the face of need because it's too hard politically for people to make truly equitable decisions um, because they're frightened about losing their position because of accusations of racial bias or privilege, which, you know, I mean, that train is never late, um, you know, when you try and act on equity. So we need a bunch of things to happen, but courage first. Um, and then this is the kind of bridge ported or again, but um, we, we, we actually need our expert communicators to explain again, <laughs> why this is not about prioritising Māori, but mm. correcting the harm that we've done by prioritising Pākehā. And so it's not about not giving Pākehā gold standard care, but just making sure that everyone gets that as well. Um, and if I can use an example that's been put forward to our hospital. So, um, you know, there are um, issues, inequities in access to elective surgery. Um, at my hospital and it's something that they've, they've looked at and you know proposing ways to address they're conscious that COVID will push those inequities you know make them more entrenched and, and potentially exacerbate them um, and so they're looking at proposing doing um, an extra day of operations um, you know for Māori um, not not giving Pākehā excellent care but just levelling it up a bit um, and it's really cool. There are two um, two Māori doctors who are, are leading the proposal with the support of the department that um, you know the relevant department. So little things like that because you do you have to go big, and then you have to go like like we know in Māori health you have to go to the community to the issue and deal with um, deal with it at every level. Um, 
yeah. So, I mean, there's some awesome people involved in the Māori Health Authority. So, you know, if anyone can make it work, it's probably the people that they've got in the room. Um, but, yeah, they, they need to move pretty quick, eh? So that also goes back to the articles that you're writing that is bridging because mm. that impacts the society within which the Māori Health Authority exists so that yeah. the rhetoric of priority treatment is lessened. Is that right? Yeah, hara. And that's like, again, that's to come back to being grateful for the time that we live in because, I, you know, um, when you talk to older Māori doctors about the kind of racism that they've experienced and, and people, um, you know, challenging them for not having a right to be there and all that kind of stuff, it's still around, but it's less. Um, and then in parallel to um, health and the way that we train doctors, which is, I can't speak to other areas of health because I haven't trained as anything else, but, you know, the likes of Paparangi Reid, um, Elena Curtis, Rhys Jones, Matere Harwood, et cetera, um, who do that excruciating work of um, getting medical students to um, unpack their biases, understand the true history of this country and the implications for our Māori patients, and then have culturally safe doctors entering the workforce. That transition has happened in parallel with a societal transition. And if I may refer again to yourself and your husband and the people that have come before you um, and making it so that um, when we try and have these conversations, there's more fertile ground for understanding and connection. Um, so that's pretty cool. Like, I mean, I'm not saying that everything's great because we've still got these terrible inequities, but, um, but it's an incredible opportunity. And I think... If we overlook the fact that you do need to bring people with you, um, then you're destined to fail because, um, you know, we, we are a minority and we do need the support of others. And you, then we bring it into politics as well, that this could change very quickly, you know, the reversal of decisions, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I didn't actually watch the speech this week, but there was some talk of reversing, like, the um, there's some, like, real estate tenancy decision or something have all the things to focus on you know but but yes you know and nothing and i and, and actually to to bring this around to another issue you know reproductive rights um i had this conversation with a good friend the other day and we we're talking about voting and so you know i've got council elections and then also national elections next year and um what are your bottom lines because we have to accept that people will have different views than us on lots of things but for me um yeah so Māori sovereignty issues, um, gay rights, reproductive rights, bottom line. So there can't, you, I, you, there's just no way that I could vote for someone who didn't support those things. And that, that's, and that's because of what you just said, is that anything can be reversed. And so, you know, you look at the awful um, stuff that's happening in the States at the moment around reproductive rights and women's access to abortion and things like that. And no, no gain um, is so entrenched that we might not lose it at some point because politics. So... Yeah, and some of those wins on the bubbly paper at Lower Hutt Women's Centre are even challenged. Exactly. Another one of the questions here, um, you've mentioned that working as a doctor is having to be part of a system that discriminates against your own people. How do you navigate that? Mm, um, with varying degrees of patience. Um, yeah, I think... I think um, Again, just to, to go back to how grateful I am to be practicing at this time, because there is a lot more support than there would have been, you know, back when, you know, the likes of Elena um, was going through. Um, so you have to be grateful for that. And um, the incredible colleagues that I have who, who challenge things as well, non-Māori and Māori. Um, I guess you use everything that you've got, don't you? So um, you do the best that you can for the patient in front of you. Um, you have as um, you have conversations um, as the hierarchy allows. Like I'm not, I don't mean to sound, you know, like a coward, but you you are at the bottom of the, you know, a pretty um, heavy hierarchy in medicine, and um, not everyone's open to the conversation, and you do have to pick your moments and be political about it. Um, but there are lots of allies to be found and lots of people offering to help. And so at our hospital, and it's not my hospital forever, you know, I'm a junior doctor, so I get moved around and can work anywhere in Auckland at the moment. But um, 
there's a, a Māori doctor's doku, um, and so when you come into the hospital, you have whakakononga you have a um, like a overall clinical supervisor who's Māori, uh, a senior, an SMRO consultant, um, and they look out for you, and they also make sure that you're doing what needs to be done for Māori as well. So it's, you know, how are you doing with your work? Great. And are you, you know, flying the flag? Are you using te reo as much as you can? Um, that kind of thing. So that's really important that, that you can see that you've got the support all through, you know, all through the levels of the hierarchy. Um, yeah, but it's difficult. Yeah, but, I, quite, quite, quite often people will say, oh, what should we do to fix it? And you're like, oh my God, just fix the thing, you know? <laughs> like it's quite, it's quite hard to have a slick answer for what we precisely need to do, you know, because it's, it is just fix everything, you know? And it's that layer of extra labour um, that isn't said to other doctors. Can you make sure you speak English? Uh, <laughs> can you make sure that you uphold, you know, general New Zealand values? Mm. You know, that's the extra mahi that you're carrying. And yeah, and, and having said all that as well, like, you know, a lot of people, given the, na the nature of medicine as kind of an evidence-based vocation, you know, they do expect you to explain to them again and again that this problem exists, why they should care, and then come up with those solutions themselves. But you know, there is some entitlement inherent in that because, you know, if people looked at equity and thought, hmm, you know, like some of my patients aren't getting care as good as other patients, maybe I should look into why that is. Um, you know, you'd think that that would have just as much importance as, you know, learning, I don't know, about the new diabetes medicine that's, you know, um, going through trials at the moment or the latest surgical technique. So it just, it really needs to be elevated as one of the most important things that, that, that we can do and I guess the establishment of the Māori Health Authority potentially you know has the opportunity to do that. So the people that you've been talking about if people don't know Dr Paparangi Rei, Dr Elena Curtis, mm -hmm. um, Dr Rhys Jones and Matsiri Howard they mostly work would you say I mean they a lot of them are on the ground as well but that's an area of public health mm. so that's an advocacy role that's yep. slightly different. Yeah um, yeah. The, and is there anything you'd like to add to that so that people understand uh, that? Yeah, just, I guess that probably, you know, medical school itself, you obviously learn a lot, but probably the best thing I did was to go and work for Hapai Te Hora when I was, um, when I was studying. So I was um, there for maybe three or four years and Salah Hart, who is now the CEO, you know, another incredible Māori woman with uh, like a million kids and 70 different jobs and, you know, Actually, just, yeah. yeah, incredible brain and uh, supportive and all of that. But it was, um, yeah, really instructive to work in public health and community public health and so um, you get to first of all you get to see um, that our communities actually have a lot of the solutions themselves and they're never given the respect or the resourcing to actually enact them and that is consistent across everything you can also see you can join up all the dots so um, when you try and implement um, you know one size fits all kind of universal um, interventions to correct inequities, for example, um, or to correct uh, health issues. So, for example, sudden unexpected death in infancy. So, initially, that was kind of a universal program. Um, and so, the rates dropped, but not for Māori as much. And so, you, you see that any time that you don't um, account for equity issues, you risk entrenching the issue and then actually widening it because you're making things not any better for the people that are worse off and then you're actually improving things for the other group. So um, that, it was fascinating to see that and that work, and then to also see all the different levers that you can use to generate change. So the, you know, the writing stuff was something that I was doing already, mm. but you know, um, submissions to parliament and influencing political leaders and, you know, it's, um, yeah, so that, that was, you know, a parallel education. Um, yeah, and, and then you yeah, those factors of your world all come together. And I'll just add another part of this question. Um, social determinants, housing, mm. education, trauma. Do they turn up in front of you every single day? Yeah, yeah, they do, yeah. Um, and I think there was a, what was the question? I think someone sent through, um, oh yeah, once people are already in the system, you know, they're, they're so buggered because of the social determinants, like what can you even do? Um, and you know, that's, I understand the premise, you know, because because a lot of the issues can be explained by differential access to social determinants of health. So safe, warm, dry home, um, you know, secure jobs, um, you know, proximity to good schools, all of that kind of thing. 
but um, that's no reason not to address the issues that we know that exist once pa patients are in front of us because it isn't all of that you know that that accounts for a lot of it but we also know from the exhaustive research that's been done that Māori encounter barriers at every point in the health system and so it's incumbent upon us to identify and address them everywhere that they're found so that's from you know um, kind of prescribing um, decisions where Māori aren't given certain medications because they're considered to be non-compliant um, whereas you you know maybe they weren't explained properly or weren't supported to actually you know access a free pharmacy or something like that um, those all those kinds of things um, it's cumulative right you know there's yes that's a big part of it but it also you know you pick up other issues along the way and I think that's another thing that I really love about my colleagues at Middlemore and again it's allied health I do love my doctor colleagues as well don't play. <laughs> don't get me wrong but you just you know you become so acutely aware of your um your deficiencies as a junior doctor you know they're just things that I cannot do um because I haven't trained to do it and I don't know anything about it but um and a lot of the system stuff we see so you know we work some, with some amazing pharmacists who know what where the free pharmacies are they'll sort out take out meds for people that might not be able to access them our occupational therapists who know you know what equipment people need will sort out all the kind of stuff with ACC to make sure that it's paid for and just really really wrap around care for our for our people for our community um, and that again is why I would have loved to have support their, supported their strike last week because you just see how much they add to patient care every single day. Kia ora. Uh, I've got some questions that have been sent through on the chat mm -hmm. and I want to get through as many as we can. One here yeah. said there was one social change that you could make to benefit wahine Māori, what would it be? So that's one social change mm. that, you could, that you could make. I don't know why you have to do it by yourself, but... Um, really hard to decide between... Um, you can have them all. This is, this is universal um, housing mm. and eradicating abuse yeah I don't know if I could choose between them because I think yeah again you know we kind of circling back to something that we talked about earlier and um, the impact of colonization is that uh, and the concept of mana wahine is that all of that connectedness and all of our power um, as Māori women um, you know what happened post colonization was kind of systematically um, designed to affect us um, and negatively affect us and so we lost loss of connection and um, identity and um, not loss but you know the taking of that um, and so you know when we look to um, the whakapapa of, of you know Māori feminists and um, the, the women that have gone before us um, just like resting that back and, um, and claiming it is is so awesome and it's just a it's a blueprint you know like I when I was preparing for this I had um you know I've got Aini Mikaida's book I've got um the reprint of Wahine um Wahine Tua Omniscient Māori Woman um and so many others the two Mana Wahine readers you know that um Leonie Pihama and oh, probably Ani as well put together and so you you just got this rich rich source um of of knowledge and support you know your virtual mentors to to draw on all the time so as a storyteller, you understand as well how you can centre some characters in a story and willfully neglect others. Is mm -hmm. that's what I'm hearing in your corridor about yeah. why yeah. Well. yeah, and who tells the story? You know, that's that's our big, you know, our friend Chelsea's big um you know, her co papa is story sovereignty. Um and, and she's, she's talking done. about Chelsea Winstanley, um, Academy Award nominated. <laughs> Our friend, <laughs> yeah, <not> producer. <laughs> so sorry, story yeah. sovereignty. Yeah. So st actually, and I've got this here. So um, so Chelsea, I I, I stalked her a little bit. I was like, because I knew that she was friends with Stacey. I was like, maybe maybe I could be mates with her too. Like she sounds so cool. Um, and then um, yeah. So I stalked her into becoming my friend. And then um, we had this really cool dinner where um, where Chelsea brought together a table of um of wahine maori um to support her when she got i can't even remember what the award was yeah award. 
Oh yeah, the Kiara Hetzra. Um, and it was kind the rowdiest table. Um, and there was some heckling and uh, and it was just, you know, this this just really awesome community to be part of. And it was we were at table thirty five. I kept it, I stole it. Don't tell anyone. Um, that. Yeah, yeah. And that's just that, you know, um, when you have empowered Maori women, we empower other Maori women and then it, you know, and it just flows from there. And that's that's, you know, I mean we're not all perfect. Like I'm not creating some kind of um you know fantasy about you know us being you know noble savage kind of thing but um you know in my experience that once once you are empowered you use that to empower others and i think for some of our tiny that's not necessarily been the case Oh, mm -hmm. I'm going to go to another question. Um, as someone who has worked in Parliament in our big hospital, do you think the discrimination against Wahine Māori as powerful leaders is different or similar? So in the Whare Paremata mm -hmm. and um, in, the, in the parliamentary houses and a big hospital, is the discrimination similar or different types of discrimination? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I absolutely think it's similar, you know, I think there is, and I, and because you see power concentrated in the same way, you know, so with um, older vested interests, um, and I think, you know, again, to kind of scrutinise myself, you know, and we've talked about this before, Stace, but you're so worried about being the, um, you know, the friendly Māori, <laughs> you know, the, the compliant one that people can, can talk to and, and you know, um, yeah, yeah, and and they're like, oh, you're not like those those angry Marys, you know, who are always having go at us. And you're like, what you don't realise is that we're all part of the same thing. And so you've just got that constant loop to yourself. Like, am I benefiting from um, allowing things to happen that other people wouldn't? And is it for myself or is it for the greater good? You know, so you've, it's such a relaxing time. Yeah. <laughs> Well, actually, you did mention yes, that. Yes, the palatable you... one. I right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the. Oh yeah, I didn't know if you heard me say that, that yeah, so we all know um, yeah. the palatable one, um, what that means, because it doesn't feel like a compliment. Um, yeah. Are we selling out to our people when we do that? Mm. Um, or are we yeah. bridging for a certain amount of time? And it's also hard to, you know, like it's that thing about how we um, how we judge our contribution and whether that's through a Pākehā lens or through, through a Māori lens. And so both politics and um, and health, even though they are kind of about greater good stuff, they also um, really kind of lionise individuals. And so, you know, that's the, the idea that there's, you know, yeah, there's kind of like a, a golden prize for the best person and then everything else is less good. And yeah, that collective energy, even though both, um, both hospital and parliament actually thrive on the, the collective, um, yeah, they, they they do prioritise the individual. So speaking of that whare, uh, whare Paramata last week, and you mentioned that you're a Tuturu Wellingtonian, mm. uh, how are your Wellington feelings after what has been happening? A lot of Wellington feelings. Um, I thought about offering to come down and help clean up the grounds, but then like I'm horrible at cleaning things and also very bad at gardens. So I would be, you know, and this is the kind of, you know, always feel like a terrible Māori woman because people assume that you must have this, you know, whenua connection and you're, you know, kia ora kitten. Um, and I'm like, no, no, back in the day, I would have had to have a place in the whare like having thoughts and stuff, not out there hunting and gathering or attempting to grow anything. Um, but yeah, I think it was a really horrible, a horrible time. And um, uh I, I had this debate with my husband about it because he was saying, oh, you know, every protest movement is imported. You know, he thought that the focus on this as a non-New Zealand um, protest was overdone. And I was like, oh, I was trying to figure that out. Like, I kind of get it in the sense that, you know, we, we march for Black Lives Matter and we, you know, nuclear free and all of these kinds of things. And But the, the difference in this protest was that like the speed at which the disinformation can spread, the cynical, um, you know, use of that disinformation and um, the influence of some really ugly parts of our society, um, co-opting, you know, any kind of um, any kind of purity of message that they might have had, and you can kind of say that people were confused and misled, but also I think you have to allow people agency as well. So you have to kind of 
find this tread a fine line between patronizing people for just being too stupid to, to know you know and going actually people made these decisions and then how do we kind of heal that rift i also don't believe that we're a you know deeply divided society like some politicians have tried to make the most out of this you know we have extraordinarily high vaccination rates we had incredible compliance of um around the public health measures to protect everyone we do have divisions but not along those lines you know that's just political opportunism Speaking of which, uh, there's a couple of questions that I, I can't neglect here. Um, and also I'm just going to turn the light on because it's like looking like I'm kind of moving. Shall I do that too? The, okay. The crew. Yeah. We both will. Okay, so here we go. And there's light. Um, cup of ice. So yeah. what do you make of Christopher Luxon's comment that high caliber Māori have reached out to be National MPs after he was criticised for not mentioning Māori in his big speech about the cost of living and, and also standing, uh, I guess, uh, that they want to stand some candidates in the Māori seats? He's talking about, he'll be talking about Lance O'Sullivan, won't he? <laughs> Oh, high calibre. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to um, Sorry. share Shut with up. you. No, no, no. I can <laughs> tell you that my husband's been approached by every party. But yeah. um, look at what Catherine said. Um, that's yeah. not of interest to everybody. No. Um, what's a high calibre Māori? Mm. Oh, man, that is a red flag. <laughs> and that is probably a good answer. <laughs> Uh, red flag. Actually, speaking of which, that reminds me of Twitter. Someone has asked down here, how do, in a general sense, you navigate and approach Twitter? Yeah, um, just with a healthy sense of the absurdity of everything, you know, like, um, there's just awesome, some awesome people on Twitter, and I've made real friends. And, um, you know, occasionally, you're on there at the wrong time of the night. And you maybe have had a couple of wines, and you get a bit you know, but, um, but no, I, I, and this is not to, you know, because I, I participated, I don't know if Sarah came tonight, but in some research about how, um, you know, social media is an unsafe space for women. And I, I'm not denying that in any way. And I've taken steps to make myself safe by, you know, um, not, you know, having the comments on mute and, um, and just not actually, you know, any time I put any any tweet I put out, I don't ever read the full thread of comments that come after it because you just know that there's going to be like a steaming pile of shit in there somewhere, um, and no one needs that. So, um, and I have the ability to do that and separate that out. Um, but you know, that's kind of my temperament, um, and not everyone is able to do that. You know, um, so I think it's just about keeping yourself safe and taking the good where you can and, and letting it go if you can't, you know. Um, yeah, and the memes, like, such great memes. The meme game is strong, the it's gift strong. game. Um, yeah. I've got a doctorate in that as well. Yeah. Another <laughs> question, how could we incorporate some elements of rongoa Māori to increase the trust and create connection and fluidity between traditional and modern methods in the hospital mm. setting? So we're talking about Rongoa Māori. Well, I've got the receipts here, actually. So one of the um, beautiful Māori surgeons uh, at Waitamata DHB, Jonathan Coyer, who, mm. um, you know, was like the the Max before Max. So Maxine Ronald, um, definitely. Treated by mother and, and helped yes. her a lot. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So Maxine Ronald been a, was a very significant, important mentor for me, Māori breast surgeon. And then, you know, kind of Jonathan's the, the one before her. Um, but he did a paper and I, uh, looking at, um, oh, I'll be so annoyed with myself for getting it wrong, but it was like attitudes to Rungwa Māori um, being introduced in this way at his DHB. And it was like, I think majority positive from all the health people that they talked to about incorporating some of this stuff. And um, I I mean, I would love to hear from someone like Arihia Latham. She's your phone owner, eh? Hi. Yeah. yeah. So, um, who teaches um, Rungwa Māori to the medical students in Wellington? Um, so, yeah, there are heaps of opportunities. I mean, there's so much, so, so, such a small part of what we do is actually the stuff that, like, I train to do at medical school, and I love that bit. Like, I'm, I wouldn't be good at any of the other stuff, um, but it is such a multidisciplinary um, service that, yeah, and and I and our Māori health team at, at Middlemore is amazing. Like, um, and they do aspects of that just in the way that they are you know it's not it's not bringing out the color color bomb or anything like that but it's 
just the the um the relationships and the way that they support Pano is the Rongwa, you know, and and the storytelling and the connection. So yeah, it's possible um, definitely. What I can share with you is there's a Rongwa symposium coming up in June uh, that is funded by the Ministry of Health and the Māori, the new Māori Health Authority. Um, it's getting input from everybody, so that would suggest that some there's some growing understanding mm. of the worth and exactly everything you've mentioned there. Noreta, tēnē kamehi kia koe. Thank you for that question. Mm. Uh, another one here, how could the housing needs of wahine Māori be met? Emma, we'd just like you to solve all of these <laughs> questions before you go to your night shift at nine o'clock. Just give them houses. Like Fine. People need a house, build a house, you know. Um, but you know, again, this is the this is papa to everything, you know. So um, I think you know back when mum and dad, like mum's Pākehā and dad's Māori, when they were looking for rentals, you know, you send the Pākehā person to have a look, and you know, all of that stuff has intergenerational flow-on effects as to, um, you know, who who has access to these things. I think was it Tainui Stevens who wrote on Ikangata over the weekend about. Um, going to talk to a landlord who had refused to offer a tenancy to a uh, yeah. and he worked for Native Affairs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um and she was just flat out like, no, I don't I don't want them to to be in my house. And she was isolated and alone and listened to talk back and that was the all the world she knew. She just thought that brown people were just bad. Um and so all of that is and, and other stuff is behind why we are the way we are. You know, and that you know that again is, is the storytelling, the mana and the and telling our stories and having the truth told, and so everyone knows, and you can't kid yourself about how we've ended up the way that we are, and say, oh, if you just worked harder or had a dream or you know pulled yourself up by your bootstraps, kind of thing. And again, like the protesters, without without undermining people's agency, because you do have to give people the credit to have agency and make decisions for themselves, but just appreciate that we don't all have the same choices, you know. Uh, and that our liberation is intertwined? I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, the next question, and it's hard not to come at it from, you know, a similar thing from different angles, uh, basically. If, what am I fixing now? Am I fixing the climate? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've got 20 minutes. Uh, can you put a Panadol on it or something? <laughs> can what we get some um, Sudafed, you know, some proper, like... <laughs> yeah, could you please address that actual Sudafed? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> what are some of the most important or neglected areas of health for wahine Māori? We've talked about midwifery, we've talked about reproductive health, mm. uh, we've talked about housing, but is there anything else that, that jumps out at you? Yeah, I mean, you would know, you know, as well from, from your work with, um, you know, breast cancer advocacy that um, access to screening is a real problem for us. Um, and I think, a um, little bit of a pivot here, but um, so I've, I've helped out with some work looking at um, bowel cancer screening up north and um, interviewing, so I didn't do the interviews, I was helping code the interviews for the research paper, but um, interviewing Māori health providers about the proposed bowel cancer screening program. And it's just like they participate they're so gracious and they say this, these are the things that we would do, these are the problems that we see and what you've suggested and there's just this deep institutional knowledge or, or community knowledge that they have of what works for our people and then a long history of research projects that they've taken part in and advice that they've given that's not been acted upon and they're always asked after the fact and it's just this you know, incredible lack of trust and um, uh, a lack of value uh, for, for, the, for the knowledge that our communities hold, you know, like um, one of the most poignant stories from this, um, from one of the interviews was, so the, the bowel cancer screen, like there's a fecal, you know, you have to send a poo sample basically, which has like implications for us as Māori, right? Like you, there's anyone with half a brain would know that and want to address that. Um, and this, this Komata who lives somewhere like miles from anywhere up north, um, didn't understand the instructions and like bought some of his poo in a bucket to the GP practice and was like, I did my thing, you know, and just the, you know, that embarrassment for him and that, that we didn't care for him so that he did the right thing, the mana enhancing thing, um, just was like, you know, 
could have been fixed, yeah. could have been addressed, you know. And so, and this is the kind of fatigue of our of our Māori health providers who, you know, incredible um, papa papa. Like, um, you know, I was having a look into the origins of the Māori Women's Welfare League last week for something, and you know, huge focus on health. Um, you know, getting involved in vaccinations and health education, um, family planning, all those conversations. Um, and you know, our Māori health providers being set up, you know, after that, and we've just got all this knowledge that we go away and sit somewhere else in a, you know, in an office and make something up and then take it to them and go, what have we got wrong this time? You know, and expect their goodwill and engagement and to tell us how to fix it. And so, yeah, we need to get, it's, I mean, I, I, it's kind of feels terrible saying it. This is so obvious, but get community involved earlier and, and just, you know, start from the beginning with our community, collaborate on the design of our, these programs. So screening, and it's a big, um, concern I know for like Rawari Jensen at Ahui you know, mate, last year or I've lost track of the years what I is think t- it was 2020 at the end of 2020 before Delta he was saying to, at, at Te Orahui, um screening is going to be a massive problem like there's going to be a huge backlog because we, we, we don't we can't access it um, as readily as non Māori anyway and it's just going to be one of those things that falls behind so we're not going to be picking up cancers you know, and, and so that, you know, you can just see the widening of those things. So that kind of, that's the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, I think most areas of Wahine Māori health are neglected. Um, and some of them just by not recognising them as aspects of Wahine Māori health, you know. Um, yeah, the housing we've talked about, um, you know, touched on abuse um, and, you know, like, go on. Gender pay gap or pay gap. Gender that pay gap, yeah. Um, yeah. Zion's done some amazing work in the last year around prison. Um, and you know the um, the experience of Māori women in prison. You know, so all, all of that stuff is is yeah, wahine Māori health, and it's it's just such a missed a missed opportunity for all of us because once, as we said before, Māori women are empowered, we bring everyone else with us. To link those two things together in media and uh, this, these health inequities, but also the narrative. Unfortunately, when I've talked about breast cancer screening, uh, a lot of the focus has been that Māori women don't engage as if the onus is on Māori women. Even Māori broadcasters have said things like that to me. And so I willfully change the script as I'm answering the question. Mm. What uh, what role does the media play as you say it and how do we make that better? Yeah, I mean, we've got, it's a, it's a massive um, obligation and responsibility that's only been recognised for in the last 10 years maybe. Um, you know, the, the, the language that you use and the story that you choose to start, tell and the perspective that you choose to use um, massively impacts um, people's interpretation of what's going on and then, and then affects, you know, and, and it's, you know, you, you kind of feel, um, you know, you, you can be disempowered by that yourself. You just read it and go, oh, I don't engage, obviously, because I'm around, like, <laughs> it's my fault. Um, and we, we talked about that a lot at Harpai, you know, like um, we'd work with, non-Māori organisations who would talk about Māori as being hard to reach and it's like well that sounds like a you problem you know like um, our community knows where they are you know like if someone had um, resourced Tina Ngata far earlier than that what you know the little that she has been given imagine what she could have done um, you know with with decent resourcing to to help um, the you know pandemic response and and you know in Hurupu. And actually on that, um, if people haven't heard Tina Ngata, uh, who lives on the East Coast, she actually had to drive someone to Gisborne Hospital on the weekend, three hours, because the ambulance recognised that she needed to go to the ED, but wouldn't take her. Um, In terms of access at the moment, ambulances, all of those things, uh, how, what is it like at the moment? What are you seeing? So... I'm going to be punished for this tonight by saying it, but actually last night was pretty quiet, like unusually quiet. Um, and that's a word that I'm not allowed to say. So I really hope that no one that's working with me tonight is on here. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the hospital is really full and, and there's a lot of COVID and that makes everything harder and take longer and we don't have enough staff. But, um, but you are seeing, I think, people staying away, which really worries me because that stuff is, it just means that they'll come more sick at a different time. Um, there's also an incredible burden on our, um, and I don't, I mean, I, I don't work in general practice, but I think um, I don't 
from what I've seen, I don't think our, our primary care providers feel particularly well supported at the moment. Um, and they're, you know, in terms of access to everything that they need to do their jobs um, and keep themselves safe. And, you know, so people aren't able to get to their GPs because everything is happening, um, you know, it, that is frontline, you know. Um, and then they don't want to come to ED because we're full of COVID and get sicker and worse at home. And then, you know, stuff like um, if you're isolating, how do you get prescriptions? And there are, you know, as, as with everything, there are well-intentioned services for anyone to access, um, but they, they're, they're not always designed with the people who need to access them in mind. So, um, yeah, that's there, there would be quite a big difference between someone who came to our hospital and had a really onto it pharmacist who was like, right, I'm going to make sure you've got everything. I'm going to hassle the junior doctor to make sure they sort of sort the stuff out for you and get you home with this kind of wraparound, you know, um, package of care um, versus, you know, just expecting someone to figure it out for themselves. Yeah. But yeah. Also, I, yeah. Who, who gets um, so to decide what's hard to reach? Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, you just, you're not talking to the right people. Um, but yeah, so our hospital, I mean, it's, you kind of, you want to tell a success story, which is that, you know, we work with amazing people who are stepping up to support each other. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking they are um, relying on the goodwill of overworked people to pull together a an under-resourced and struggling health system. And things aren't going to get better for us after the pandemic. We're going to have all the catching up to do. We're going to be tired. Um, there's still not going to be any annual leave available for us and our underpaid colleagues are still underpaid. So it's just, you know, um, yeah, we, yeah, this is the compassion fatigue thing. This is why people are, you know, burning so out. Makes me wonder, how do you decompress at times like this so that the time that you have that is downtime is... Uh, fruitful and that it is actually rejuvenating and are, are there any whakaaro Māori that are linked into that? Mm. Um, <laughs> I'm not very good at that as you know um, <laughs> um, yeah I mean this is this is going to sound super weird but being here tonight with all of you is is actually just really energizing and I feel I feel good about going to, to work tonight because, um, you know, I'm part of this incredible community. So, um, yeah, I, connection is key. Yeah. Um, I don't really relax. I, I, I know it's a problem and it's not like a goal, a big goal, but, um, like, have a sleep and read a book. Maybe. Actually, reading a book. There we go. Yeah. You've found yeah. it. Well yeah. done. And, you know, I mean, I've got a pretty straightforward home life, you know, like we, we just at home. We've got a dog. Which is not relaxing. No, that was a ridiculous idea. But, yeah, you know, yeah, that um, was fun. <laughs> but but knowing the spaces that energise you and that mm. it goes back to the beginning of our quarter around a woman's centre, women's centre and lower hut. Mm. So those feelings and everything that you can pour into the chat right now, mm. uh, just with your presence, with your attention, uh, with your willingness to engage uh, this is what we can do we can't do what you do for a job but we can offer you this tautoko matahi tēnā and and i hope that you can feel that you have a force with you tonight uh, and that we are full of hope um, but respect as well another oh, question yeah. here and i'm sorry that you feel like you can't lie to me which is actually quite good <laughs> Um, what's the relationship between the welfare system, which is also something you mentioned at the beginning of the quarter, and mm. wahine, and health for wahine Māori? Well, actually, and and all of us actually, anyone who's engaged with the welfare system mm -hmm. and the health system. I think I mean I kind of understood the welfare system very early um, because um, so Mum's partner at the time was a you know Labour Party activist. Um, and that was deeply relevant to us because um, it was only with her support and with speaker Trevor Mallard's support that we were able to get a state house um we were offered you know like a pretty horrible flat um uh before they got involved so you know always be grateful you know to the Labour Party for that um but yeah in the 90s you know it was like overnight um people people's you know um benefits were slashed and um, you saw the very tangible impact of that. Um, and I just think, um, 
yeah, I just don't know why we punish people with the welfare system, you know, just make it so difficult. Um, and, you know, if people have to spend all their energy trying to access what they have a right to, then how do we expect them to, you know, lift themselves up or, or hope for anything better, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's just a, less punitive, easier to access prioritise children, you know, because um, this is what it's really about, isn't it, is that, that, that there's so many children in these households that deserve better from all of us. So, yeah. I don't want a tax cut, by the way, either. <laughs> like, no, I, I don't know. It's either. on the table now, but, like, come on. <laughs> How are we going to pay for everything? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, and, and this is not at all leaning at in any particular political party, but just what mana enhancing looks like, what uh, aroha looks like, what respect looks like, mm. and that people deserve this, not should forever be intergenerationally traumatised uh, mm. for what their whanau is, is living through at that particular time. Yeah, and just to see it as an investment, you know, like, this is an investment in the future of our country. Like, it's quite straightforward. Kapai. Oh my god, I read that. I thought that was Susan. I thought that was Sean Punk and I was like, what is Sean doing here? <laughs> I think it's safe to say Susan, I'm very sorry. <laughs> okay, we need to go to back to our optometrist friend um Renata. <laughs> oh, she, I agree. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um <laughs> oh I mean, that must happen a lot. Um I'm very sorry, it, I'm sorry. <laughs> very triggering for everyone so um, yeah there's, that's, that's a triggered word, word also the q words did not happen at all all of those things no, it's fine just have it we could do um we could have your your karakia stace that you um that you gave me when i had to do that that scary thing once was it for this rupu that you uh no no i think it, oh, oh no, no. no you know what i'm talking about yeah. Yes. Um, would, would you like to do it for us? No, I'm just suggesting that you might like to. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, as we come to a close tonight, I will actually pass it over to uh, the Hokainga, uh, the Women's Centre, to close us up. But I will offer that karakia. But first of all, uh, as Catherine said here, hope that you feel us walking with you. And it's not just you, it is Colleen. It's your whakapapa, mai, 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 from a long time ago. It's about the hope. It's all of us who grew up with a single mum uh, on the DPB. All of those things that you dare to dream, they give us capacity to dream and our liberation is intertwined. Nō reira e mehi nui ana kia koe, e taku tuakana, e taku kurupau namu. Uh, hei kōrero whakamutunga maupea, is there anything you'd like to leave us with? No, I, just, I feel very loved. My favourite thing. Kuna te rongoa, unga rongoa. It is the most important medicine. Is that aroha? Karanga, karanga te rangi e tu nei. Karanga, karanga te papa e takoto nei. Raranga hia mai te ira tua. Raranga hia mai tua wa hine. Kohine ahuone. Kohine tītama. Kohine rau farange. Kohine te iwa iwa kua e tu nei. Kohine i te ata. We ha to my temori. How me who ye die? Was that me? Come, my three. order. <laughs> Jeepers, I don't know what words I was supposed to say, but um, uh, so much kai for the heart and and the, and the brain and the and I, you know, laughing is such huge medicine. Um, and I think it's an aspect in the that we that we forget about how crucial mm. that is to um, keeping our modi up and making us feel good. Mm. So uh, nui ngami aroha. I know you have to run off, Emma. Thank you so so much. Uh, yeah, uh, so I have to say things like there's going to be a link to this um, <laughs> somewhere, sometime probably on the AWC site and thank you ngami. Also, um, Stacey as as always, did you want to finish with another karakia? Um, the one that Emma was talking about was that the one? Oh, that was that was the one. I can do another. No, um, no that was the <laughs> one. But I no, um, particularly one, one. yeah, Donna and um, Bride as well, our interpreters. We appreciate you, Kelda Kordua, Tina Kordua. And it's back to you, Nicola. You're the boss. Oh, it feels funny doing it. My, our karakia after your karakia. I feel you, that, that you've um, closed us. That you've closed us up. Sorry.
sorry, that was me. And settled us and, <laughs> and um, yeah, held us all. So, Modi order, Tato. No reira e karema. Uh, please go with that energy. Uh, we're all doing our best out there, and please know that we see you. We, I felt your energy tonight, and so appreciated it. No reira. Uh, one more time, she'll give it a home year. Hui e tai ki. Home year. Hui e tai ki. Mauri ora. O mari.